very nice to be in this very interesting session. And I want to um, thank you for having me. I'm going to try my best to provide you information that may be of, of importance and interest to you, given the next steps you need to, uh, to take on. I will try to be very short and tell you briefly a situation that Greece, the 28th um, richest country in the world, found itself in in 2009 and um, where we are right now. And uh, then, of course, in the conversation later on, I can give you my thoughts about, um, <clears throat> about Sri Lanka as well. So in, um, in 2009, we found ourselves with a debt that is very similar to the debt that you're dealing with right now. We had a debt of 110 to 120 percent of GDP. We had a deficit, uh, a deficit that was calculated to be 16%. And um, a very, very sudden realization of this crisis, exactly because of the fact that the deficit was realigned from 9% to 16%, as our spreads to the German bond were growing pretty much exponentially. So we started with a 5% interest rate on our on a 10-year um, bond, I'm sorry, to a five-year bond, and it went up to 10%, 12%, 15%. In about two months, all of this happened, and we were not able to service our, our, um, our bondholders, our bonds. So we got into three three interventions from, um, they were combined, three interventions, I'm sorry, the three interventions were separate, but they were with combined organizations, the IMF, the European Commission, and the ECB. We received about 320 billion euro. So we got 320 in, in its total totality. Uh, and today we're dealing with something that people think we're in a good place because we did not really default, whereas effectively we did. We did not really default and we uh, are still part of the Eurozone. Our deficit is actually non-existence. We have, we have a surplus because we have applied a very stringent um, austerity policy with fiscal adjustments. So our, our surpluses are running about three and a half to four percent. What happened is we had several, I'm going to talk to you about the lessons learned, which are, which are very important for you to, to uh, see. They wouldn't hear about default, they wouldn't hear about um, controlled default, they wouldn't hear about about even calling the IMF to provide advice, advice, not money, advice. We, ha we wasted a, a quarter of, um, of, um, of, a of a fiscal year, three, four months, just going around ourselves and our tails, figuring out how we're gonna collect the money to give to every two months payments we had to pay. So the conclusion was, um, that it was an imposed conclusion from the European Union to us that indeed our problem was a liquidity crisis and not a sovereign default crisis, which is all dependent on our inability to be productive. The ratio of our debt to GDP would not have been a problem if our investment would be running in productive sectors. If, in other words, the debt would have been investment in productive sectors. Instead, our debt was all based on zero productive sector capacity. Now, I'm exaggerating when I say zero. Maybe it's like 10%. But it's not enough. It was not enough to push the whole, to, to, to change the, the trend of the, of the economy. The fact that we handled the debt as and the crisis as a liquidity crisis reduced further the productivity capacity of the country. I think I, it sounds very similar to what you're going through by not really trying to hold the economy and take the, the bull from the horns, but instead trying to like figure out how you're gonna get money to pay your next, your next installment. Um, 
the the fact that we had to address this as a fiscal and and liquidity crisis increased our austerity and increased taxes increased basically taxing the savings of households our major our major crisis was based on the fact that there was huge amounts of debt that was um, managed by the government sector and the private sector was mingled together with the government sector. So basically we had a multiplier of one. And what occurred is that the austerity that happened and the fiscal adjustment that took place completely eliminated the productive capacity further of the country. And, and we are a net importer, not as high as you guys are, but we are a net importer. Uh, given that we're not a productive um, country in terms of even agricultural goods. The lessons learned from this is that uh, 10 years later, we got into a COVID crisis. So we never really managed to hold ourselves together. And now we're in a second crisis, which is the COVID crisis, which thank God in one way, they're the good and the bad news, the good news is that the COVID crisis, given that it has touched more than just my, our country, but the planet, um, we have had a lifting of the conditionalities of keeping, you know, very stringent uh, primary uh, surpluses, very stringent. So the 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 worst situation was that um, we we noticed that in the end we managed to come into some equilibrium, if you like, with our lenders. The equilibrium with our lenders was to pretty much agree to the fact that we are not a very productive country and we're going to just try to do the best we can to make them happy. We never had a national plan that would actually promote the growth of this, of this, poor, person, of this poor country, if, if I may say. So my lessons learned to this is the following. An economic crisis in the 21st century is no longer an economic crisis as it used to be in the 90s when I used to work at the World Bank. And I remember every economic crisis in the early 90s was perceived as such. Later on, at the end of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century, politics and geopolitics got very much involved in that. So the attention a country will take and the proper attention a country will take and the proper diagnosis a country will actually get will very much depend on how important the country is in the geopolitics and how, leader, how much leadership plays a role as well, how strong the leadership is to make sure that it explains the diagnosis correctly. Usually with a sovereign default, we have a state that is, that is also sick and it's not functioning appropriately. Therefore, the leadership doesn't seem to be extremely um, strong to actually present the case. So the second thing I need to make to, to suggest is the leadership is one thing. The appetite for reform is something else. So you may have, I, we found a lot of times, we've had prime ministers, I've worked with four of them. We've had prime ministers that pretended to be very serious and pretended to want to go out and give a leadership kind of a message that yes, indeed, we're going to change our productive capacity and we're gonna do transformative reforms. However, from the mouth of the leader, these words were not being trickling down to any other official that would have an appetite of reform. So if we don't have a state with an appetite of reform, then this is really doomed. The next two things that I want to mention is restructuring of the debt is really important. We did do, however, a restructuring of the debt in Greece without having established, as I told you earlier, a proper sequencing of, of structural issues that needed to be changed. Sequencing of related to property rights reform so that assets can be actually bankable. Uh, security of ownership and security of um, identity so that people can become bankable themselves properly without very high interest rates. 
licensing and reduction of bureaucracy and bureaucratic um, administrative uh, barriers that basically make our country completely unattractive to local investment, let alone foreign investments. So trying to do a, a restructuring and calling it um, managed default through a, through a, cons, con, a, a restructuring that is consenting together with the lenders and the, and, the, and the country is of course much more desirable. But in, in that, it, you need to have two requirements for such a thing to occur. One is you need to have a very serious reform team with a very serious reform leader. And at the same time, we need to have a lot of reserves. We need to not have run our reserves to the ground because if you have run your reserves to the ground, everybody knows that you are not really in control of your country anymore. So you are, um, you meaning one, the country is in, in the hands of the lenders. And that's exactly what happened to our country. So, it is, I would focus very much, and I still discuss this, and now we're trying to do it in Greece, focusing and resulting in the actual areas where the problem occurred in the first place, which is productivity, and then why productivity and in which sectors, and where is informality in the whole concept of the productivity? How much informality exists in the country? The, the situation in Greece has been so bad that because no one handled informality, we kept on taxing the same people over and over and over and over again. So right now we have business as usual, 10 years ago, people that evade taxes, people that work in the informal sector, um, transaction costs are extremely high bureaucratic uh, hurdles that are very, very high and a very impoverished um, population. We started with 2.2% of extreme poverty in 2009, and today we have 17% extreme poverty. And we're still talking about the 28th richest country in the world, which is an oxymoron.